this is vodcast number 14. We are covering section 4.4 in the textbook and the topic for section 4.4 is the Reynolds transport theorem. The Reynolds transport theorem is a large overarching theory that relates a system approach or a Lagrangian approach of fluid analysis to an Eulerian or control volume uh, system or approach, control volume or open system approach. So we're going to go through this and also look at the relationship between the Reynolds transport theorem and the material derivative, which we covered in sections past. So right now, uh, if you take a look at your textbook, we're right here um, on page 181, beginning our conversation about the Reynolds transport theorem. Okay, so over here on the document camera, we have uh, the basic ideas that we need to cover. The first, RTT, or Reynolds Transport Theorem, as I said, is the theorem that relates a system to a control volume. So when I say a system, what I am talking about is a particular set of particles. So we're not just talking about the same amount of mass, but we're talking about a particular slug of mass. And a control volume is the place through which that system passes. So in the diagram here, uh, I've drawn a piece of a pipe, which in this case is the control volume. And the edges or the boundaries that I'm looking at uh, is the control surface. So the edges of the pipe and the entrance and the exit of the section of pipe that we're looking at as we have a mass flow rate in and a mass flow rate out uh, is the, are the variables that we're looking at in this particular system. Now in any, in, at time t equals zero, the mass, this particular slug of mass or the particular set of particles is exactly contained within the control volume. But as time passes and the fluid moves, you can see that there will be some mass entering the control volume that is not part of the system. And then you will have some part of the system leaving the control volume, which is part of the system, but is no longer contained within the control volume because it is passed through the control surface. So in this respect, we can say that the system is that Lagrangian approach or this particular set of particles and the control volume is an Eulerian method of analysis. So in order to tie back into the book and to look at Reynolds transport theorem, we need to define the variable capital B and the variable small b. Capital B is any extensive property of the fluid. And small b is the corresponding intensive property. Or in other words, little b is capital B divided by M. Now, B, capital B and little b can be either vector or scalar. So in the case of momentum, which I've just used as an example, capital B could be the vector momentum, m times v, and then little b would be the velocity, or capital B divided by m, which would be m times v divided by m, which is just v. So that's the relationship, and that's the name of the variable that they use, uh, capital B or small b, just to designate any property of the fluid. Now, if you continue thinking about that, uh, we can see then that if capital B, mass is a property of the fluid. So if capital B is equal to mass, small b is equal to mass divided by mass, which is just equal to 1. And the derivation of Reynolds transport theorem is in your textbook on page 182 to 185. And you can see that we reference uh, capital B equals mass times little b. Then we take a limit. We have a differential equation where we're taking about 
we're taking a differential of volume, this del V with a bar through it, V with a bar designating volume, times a density times the little property B, V, B, excuse me. So if you think about this, rho times volume, rho is equal to mass times volume, isn't it? So rho times volume is equal to mass. So in other words, the parenthetical quantity here, rho times del V is a del M, and if we multiply that by little b, we have a capital B, and in this case, we have capital B as a system. So everything is dimensionally equivalent. Now, one thing that we need to notice is that this uh, integral, the limits on the integral are of the system, and so we can look at B of the system, and then we can take a derivative, dB of the system, dt, and that's going to be the differential, the derivative of this integral property with respect to time. Similarly, dB of the control volume, what I'm trying to point out here is that these look very similar, but they're actually quite different. This is of a system or of those par that particular set of particles, that particular set of mass, and this, on the other hand, is of the control volume, so the space that the system passes through. And how do we relate those two? Well, that is the act of the Reynolds, or the purpose of the Reynolds transport theorem. But here is an example of where the system and the control volume are different in a very substantial way. This is a fire extinguisher with the valve closed. When we open the valve, what happens? Some of the mass escapes the control volume. So the control volume here is still fixed in size. Some of the mass of the system is in here, but some of the mass is out here. So in other words, the mass of the system is now, in part A, the mass of the system was entirely contained within the control volume of the fire extinguisher, and now we have the mass being partially in the fire extinguisher and partially expelled from the fire extinguisher. And so that's what this example talks about here. All right. Now, if you continue on through your textbook, the derivation is all here on pages 182 through 185, and I'm not going to go into it uh, in specific. I want to get down to two equations. Uh, equation 414 is very important. It's specific, but it, uh, it, it has some serious, some meanings. It's very useful, I guess is what I would like to say. And 419 is the more general form of the Reynolds transport theorem. So equation 419 is on page 189 of your textbook, and I kind of wanted to talk about that first, although your textbook does it in the opposite order. But let's take a look at the more general form, uh, equation 419. 419, which is given on page 189 of your textbook, says that capital DB cis DT, and if you remember this capital, means the material derivative or the substantial derivative, is equal to something about the time rate of change, the time effects in the control volume, plus something about the mass that is passing over the control surface, which makes sense. It relates directly back to this, uh, to this picture or to the example that we just talked about with the fire extinguisher. So in other words, the material derivative means that we're looking at all the changes. We're looking at the convective or spatial effects. We're also looking at the time effects. So the, the material derivative of the system or the substantial change of those particular particles is going to be equal to the time rate of change in the control volume plus what passes in and out of the control volume. You notice that here we have capital B of the system. Here we have little b times that rho db term, which we already decided or I explained to you is a mass term times little b, and mass times little b is equal to, to, uh, to db, to capital B. And here we have a similar equation. We have a rho and an a times n and then a little v. So this is going to require a little bit of explaining. Basically, if you look at v dot n, we're talking about a dot product. And if you consider the idea of a dot product, what we're talking about, if you remember, is it turns out to be, uh, if it's a vector dotted with another vector, we're talking about the quantities that are perpendicular to each other. So when we have a v dot n, 
This is just like with a moment. If you remember, well, a moment's a cross product, so I don't want to get into that exactly. But when you have a dot product, you're looking at a component in a particular direction. So if you have an entrance, and if you have a velocity, we're really interested in the velocity that is perpendicular to the last term, which is the area. So if our velocity vector looked like this, we would need to be just talking about the term that is perpendicular to that. Well, why is that? Well, because really, if you think about it, a v dot a term, if these are perpendicular to each other, a velocity times the cross-sectional area that it passes through is equal to a flow rate, which is called q, or it could be v dot, I guess, a volumetric flow rate. So then if we multiply that by some sort of a density term, uh, we know that mass density is equal to mass per volume. So if we say that, Q, that V dot is equal to a volume per time, if we multiply rho dot times V dot, we get that the volumes cancel out and we get a mass per time, which is a mass dot or a mass flow rate. So we're always looking at that perpendicular because we really want to see what's actually coming out of the control volume. And the physical interpretation is perpendicular to, uh, perpendicular to each other. All right. So what's the relationship between this and the material derivative? Well, the answer is that the Reynolds transport theorem is just the integral counterpart of the material derivative, but both relate the system to the control volume. Now, as we said, 419 is the general form of this equation. 414 is a little more specific, but it's quite useful. This is the form of the Reynolds transport theorem in which we have a single inlet, a single outlet, and we have some sort of uniform flow, meaning that the property is changing in a uniform way within the control volume. So what we can say then is that dB of the system dt is equal to dB CV dt plus b dot in, b dot out minus b dot in. So this is the property entering and exiting, entering and exiting. This is the change within the control volume, and this is the change of the overall system. So this equation is easier to use, but the conditions have to be met. That we have a single outlet, a single inlet, and uniform change within the control volume. All right, so the relationship then between the two is the same, except for one is a material derivative, so it's a differential equation, and one is the integral counterpart of that differential equation. All right, in the second part, um, we take a look at the steady, steady flow, or if we have steady effects. And uh, you can, the Reynolds transport theorem, as we said, has accounts for both the steady and unsteady, or both the time and the spatial or convective coordinates. So if we have steady flow, what we can say is that the material derivative of the system with respect to time is equal to the integral over the control surface of rho times little b times v dot n dA. Or in other words, uh, we're not really having any changes with respect to time. We just have what's entering and exiting at the control surface defining the rate of change of that particular mass. Uh, down here, I worked out the units. We already talked about this a little bit, but Basically, B dot is going to be some sort of a B per time. So if we have a B per M, which is little b times mass per time, uh, we can cancel the masses and come up with a B per time. And mass per time is really just mass flow rate. All right. Now, we do have a situation where we can have uh, unsteady effects. And what that means is, is in the case of looking here in your textbook, for unsteady effects, we're really considering the type of flow where the material derivative of whatever property uh, with respect to time is not equal to zero. Excuse me, not the material derivative, the partial with respect to time. So in other words, this is the first part of the material derivative, the D, and it's actually using the same uh, 
symbology, using the empty parentheses rather than the B term to define that particular uh, quantity. But it's saying that we are having some rate of change with respect to time um, as a d in addition to or possibly not having convective effects, although that's kind of a weird, th weird situation too. But we can see then that when we have these convective effects that the material derivative is going to equal the time, the first, the derivative with respect to time uh, across the control volume of the rho little b dv. And here we have a situation where we have some sort of unsteady effects, where we have a velocity here as a function of time and a velocity here as a function of time, so that there's something changing uh, within this constant diameter pipe. And once again, they do a pretty good job of showing the control surface, the, C, the CS, in a different color here. We have a dotted blue line, whereas the pipe itself, the boundary of the pipe, is shown with the solid black. And then we see the control, uh, the fluid moving into and moving out of the control volume through the control surface. Okay. So if you take a look at this equation, we have uh, over the control surface, we have that same integral, and it reduces to this idea of a density times the initial velocity squared times the area, and then of course these are the uh, vector i. And so what we're really talking about here, if we put it on the document cam, is this sort of a situation. We have a pipe, we have unsteady effects, we have mass entering and exiting, and we don't really, what exactly is going to be equal to each other? Well, after you run through the derivatives and the integrals, and you come up with this, okay, you can then say that this term is going to be equal to this term. Now, in this case, we're just using a single row. Uh, so what we're really saying is that if this row is constant, which I'm not sure that that actually pops out of the derivative of the integral or not. Um, but basically, that everything here has to be equal to everything here because we're both in the i direction, just indicating that we have one dimensional flow in the x direction. Okay, so one example where you might see something like this is if you have uh, a pipe of variable size or you have some sort of an effect that has to do with time. So you have water, for example, coming into a pipe at one velocity, and then you increase the velocity so that there's more flow into the pipe at a different time, and that it changes. It can be periodic. It can be some sort of a change that's uh, steady or measurable in fashion, or it can be totally random. Now, the last part of the Reynolds Transport Theorem section 4.46, before we talk about 4.47, which is just a general discussion uh, item. In 4.46, 4.4.6, to be explicit, uh, in your textbook on page 193, we talk about moving control volumes. Well, what we have here is there's a picture in your textbook of a jet or a nozzle hitting some sort of a vein and the water, as it hits the vein, is sliding up the vein, but it's also causing the vein to move. The trick when you have this, although we're not going to do any problems like this in our homework or on the exam, the trick is, is that you need to use a relative volume. In other words, you think about the control volume as moving with some kind of a constant speed. If it accelerates, uh, you have to take it up one level to an acceleration term, but the, you'd have to use relative accelerations, and then you have to go down through what that relationship looks like. But for this case where we have a vein moving with a constant velocity v sub zero, we can say that the velocity of the control volume uh, is equal to v sub zero, and that the relative velocity between the fluid, the water coming out of the nozzle, and hitting the control volume is then v1 minus V0 in order to, uh, if they're both in the X direction. And so the symbol that they use for that is W, 
meaning the relative, uh, the relative velocity. So in other words, the velocity of the control volume is equal to the velocity of the water minus the relative velocity, or the relative velocity is equal to the velocity of the water minus the velocity of the control volume. So you work the same equations, you use Reynolds transport theorem in the same way, but you use relative velocities instead of absolute velocities. All right, so the last little section just talks about this, the last little section, 4.47, talks about the selection of a control volume, and it's, it's, there's a hundred different ways to select a control volume. Uh, there's not really necessarily one way that is absolutely correct, but there are some ways that are a lot easier than others. So often you want to select it so that you can describe the movement of the system from the control volume in some sort of a non-random way. So here they're just showing you where you have a control volume moving with some velocity V sub CW, and so that the velocity of the system is actually going to be this relative velocity. So they show you that they draw what the path lines look like moving from the control volume. And, uh, and it, it, like I said, it's not really like a particular correct answer, but the best way to think about it is to choose it in such a way that you can examine the fluid moving into and out of the control volume in as non-random a matter a manner as possible. So, fluid moving into a control volume is referred to as influx, which is a word you may be familiar with. Fluid moving out of a control volume is referred to as efflux or efflux. Okay, and basically, regardless, we still have material balance, which we'll talk about in chapter five pretty extensively, but mass in, mem dot in, the mass flow rate in, uh, the rate of change of mass within the control volume with respect to time, and the mass flow rate out are all related by the fact that if you have the mass flow rate in and you subtract from it the mass flow rate out, that that is going to equal the rate of change of mass within the control volume with respect to time, or uh, you could say that the mass flow rate in, I don't like it in this form, I'd rather say the mass flow rate in minus the mass flow rate out is equal to the rate of change of mass within the control volume with respect to time, at least instantaneously. Um, if if it's steady, then you can extrapolate that to a broader type of a behavior. All right, so that ends chapter four for us. Uh, the last thing I'd like to do today is to work a problem that will sort of demonstrate some of these ideas. And the problem that I'd like to work for you is on page 203 of your textbook, and it's problem 4.60, which I'll put up on the screen in just a moment. It's a little hard to see because the words to the problem are here and the picture to the problem is here. So if I expand a little bit, I kind of lose the problem itself. So let's see if I can pull up a little bit. See, I think, yeah, it's not going to work. All right, so let's just go down here and I'll just bring up as much as I can. All right, so if you read through the verbiage of the problem, we are told that water flows through a two meter wide rectangular channel uh, with a velocity of three meters per second. Now that means that on this diagram that the dimension going back into the board is two meters, right? It's two meters wide. So it's 0.5 meters high and two meters wide. And the uniform velocity is three meters per second. We want to directly integrate equation 416 with B is equal to one to determine the mass flow rate in kilograms per second. All right, so if we consider that problem, flipping over to the document cam,
Hang on. There we go. It didn't flip over for me right away. What we have, this is my drawing of the textbook. Velocity 3 meters per second, 2 meters wide, 0.5 meters high, and we have an angle of theta between the vertical and the surface. Uh, of the control surface, the exit or the efflux side of the control surface. We're told that little b is equal to 1. That must mean that b, capital B, is equal to mass, right? Because little b is equal to, in this case, mass over mass, which is equal to 1. And we want to know what m dot is. So if we know b is equal to mass, m dot must correspond to b dot in this equation. All right. So 416 is in your textbook on page 188, and it says that B dot out is equal to the flow on the outlet or on the efflux side of the control surface of row little b, V uh, dot n. And this is where we're needing to take into account that angle theta, right? Because it's, since it's a dot product and we're talking about uh, v times the cosine of theta times the area. Um, then we can also see, this is, the, this is sort of the point or the punchline of this problem, is that since we're looking at the velocity cosine theta times the A, the area, we know that the area is 2 meters times the hypotenuse of this triangle. Well, the hypotenuse of this triangle is going to be uh, 0.5 divided by the cosine of theta, right? Because if this angle is theta, this is 0.5. Let's see, make sure I can see this. So I could say that L, which is what I'm looking for, uh, times the cosine of theta is equal to 0.5 meters, or L is equal to 0.5 meters over the cosine of theta. So what we see in our equation down here is that that angle doesn't actually matter, does it? Because we have cosine theta on the bottom from that sloped control surface. And we have velocity times the cosine of theta uh, from the velocity dot n. So cosine theta cancels cosine theta and just leaves the equation. So we just have density, velocity, and this dimension 0.5 times 2 meters squared, which is just 1 meter squared. So here's rho, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed for water. Cosines cancel out. Velocity, 3 meters per second. We have meters uh, per second times meters. Here's meters squared, and here's meters to the third. So this is meters in the denominator, meters in the numerator, meters in the denominator cancel, and we're left with kilograms per second, the value of which is 3 times 1,000 or 3,000 kilograms per second for our B dot out. And that is a good unit for mass flow rate, isn't it? All right, now the last part of the problem asks us, let me come back here to the Podium PC, there we go. Uh, B part, it says, part B says repeat part A, only in this case let's have B is equal to one over rho, where rho is the density and explain the physical interpretation of that. All right, well, if B is equal to one over rho, it means it's equal to one over mass per volume, or it's equal to volume over mass. Since little b is equal to b over mass, capital B over mass, that must mean that b, capital B, is equal to volume. That's just checking out the units. So b dot out then is equal to volume per time or volumetric flow rate. And uh, the physical meaning of that is just, is just that it's volumetric flow rate. So what is the volumetric flow rate? Uh, let's take a look at equation 416 again. We get B dot out is equal to the integral on the outlet of rho B V N D A. But in this case, we're told that little b is equal to 1 over rho, 
So rho and rho in the denominator cancel each other out. So we're then left with the integral over the control surfaces out of v dot n dA perpendicular component. And we know that v dot out in this case is volumetric flow rate out. So my velocity then is uh, 3 meters per second times the cosine of theta times my area, which is 0.5 over the cosine of theta times 2. And this is meters, this is meters. So I have meters, 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 meters to the third. Cosines cancel out. 0.5 times 2 is 1 times 3 is uh, 3 cubic meters per second. And so that is a good unit for volumetric flow rate. All right then, class, that concludes our lecture for section 4.4 on the Reynolds Transport Theorem. And it also concludes chapter 4. So at this point, uh, we have covered all of the material for our second exam in class. And when you're ready for a, a review session, uh, let me know or we'll schedule it and we'll get you ready for exam number two. Thanks. Have a great day.